So good right. afternoon and welcome to the Office of Economic Development Business Information Session. My name is Margaret McGee and I'm the Business Services Manager. Business services assist entrepreneurs and business owners in starting and growing their business. We help in navigating through the different departments within city government to obtain permits and licenses. We also connect the business community with organizations that can provide technical assistance, incentives, resources, and other programs beneficial in operating your business. One way we do this is to host business information sessions. These sessions are held throughout the year and topics are gathered from entrepreneurs, surveys, and information we collect from the business community. This is the third of three sessions. The first, <clears throat> the first was held September the 22nd. The topic was Nonprofit 101. The second was held September the 29th. The topic was Nonprofit Public Relations and Marketing. And today we're continuing with nonprofit grant writing and fundraising. I am pleased to introduce Ms. Roselle Ungar, Executive Director of the Jewish Family Service of New Orleans. Ms. Jenny Rogers Bigelow, owner of Practical Solutions for Fundraising. And Ms. Nora Erstein. I said it right, founder and CEO of Funding Seed. All are part of the Association of Fundraising Professionals, uh, the Greater New Orleans chapter. AFP's vision is to stimulate the world of generosity and positive social goods through fundraising best practice. Their mission is to empower individuals and organizations to practice ethical fundraising through professional education, networking, re research, and advocacy. Um, I ask that everyone place their questions in the chat box and we'll get to them at uh, the end of each presentation. I'll now turn it over to our uh, speakers for today. Thank you, Margaret, so much. Um, on behalf of Jenny and Nora, we're really delighted to be here. We were thrilled to be asked to have this opportunity to speak to you about the fundraising component of, of starting and managing a successful nonprofit. So um, I am Roselle Unger. I'm the past president of a local chapter of AFP, the Association of Fundraising Professionals. And I'm a recipient of the Outstanding Fundraising Professional Award in 2017. So I currently serve as the Executive Director of Jewish Family Service of Brain in New Orleans. As a graduate of the AFP Faculty Training Academy, um, I've used my skills and expertise to train nonprofit boards and professional staff in the areas of board development and fundraising skills. Um, before I get started, a few housekeeping notes and I'm also going to pre-introduce Nora and Jenny so that we get all the intros done first. We'd love to see faces if you're brave enough to let us see you on the screen. If not, it's okay. Everybody doesn't have its green magic moment, but we would love to see faces. Um, as Margaret said, um, please put your questions in the chat. Our group looks small enough though, that when we do open it up for questions and answers, I think we can also catch them that way as well. So each of us are going to take a piece of this fundraising component. I'm going to, I'm going to talk a little bit about what it looks like on a higher level. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about fundraising. It's not just one person's responsibility. And Nora is really going to get into the weeds about actually fundraising. And Jenny's going to get into the weeds about um, grants and where all of that fits in. So I'm going to do my intros with both of the other two speakers now. I'm going to get started. Uh, so, so Nora is a board member of the New Orleans Association of Fundraising Professionals. She is also founder and fundraising coach with the Funding Scene, a New Orleans-based company that teaches people how to raise money for nonprofits. Her professional expertise in fundraising is in fundraising for small shop nonprofits. And during her 20 plus years in the field, she has worked with over 100 organizations to help them become successful with their fundraising. 
Now, Jenny is currently the chapter president of the New Orleans chapter of the Association of Fundraising Professionals. And she has 25 years experience as a development professional and has raised over $500 million. And I read that correctly, guys. Um, Jenny is a grant writing consultant and an adjunct faculty member of the University of New Orleans, where she teaches a graduate level class in grant writing. So I, those are our speakers. Um, and I think you're in for an excellent 90 minutes, a little bit less now. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and I'm going to get, I'm going to get started with my piece and I'm just going to talk to you. Come on. There we go. All right. Um, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about how fundraising is not just one person's responsibility. I've been a nonprofit professional and a fund development professional for decades. And it's really important that you that everyone realizes that it's not just the CEO executive director's responsibility or the development professional's responsibility or the board's responsibility. It's really everyone's responsibility. And it, I really look at it as it takes a village. It does. You need everybody working together and so that you can be successful in fundraising. It's not just one person's job, it's everyone's job. Um, so who's part of your village? Your CEO, executive director, your board of directors, and your development staff. And I say staff loosely, if you're a small nonprofit, you could be the, you could be the CEO and or the executive director and the development staff person. Um, I'm not necessarily talking about big development offices where you have a chief development officer and development coordinators and you have grant managers and you have this and you have that. I, my agency, I have 25 staff and um, I have 25 staff on my working currently in my agency. I have a events and communications coordinator who manages the event. I'm the development staff. That's just how we're structured. Um, Jenny writes my grants, so um, because I outsource that, because um, it's not a skill set that I really, uh, really thrive at. So you really have to look at the three different, three different pillars for success. So the CEO, executive director is the chief fundraiser. Okay, um, and. Why should they be spending so much time raising funds? Well, there are really two very important reasons for that they should be involved in the fundraising process. First, the CEO should be aware of the bottom line. There is a financial need to get involved in fundraising, even if they disdain this kind of activity. For many organizations, the revenue stream from operations is diminishing, so there's a strict business need to help raise funds. The person who is the executive director in this position prior to me um, hated fundraising. She didn't like it. She told him up front she never liked it. Um, it didn't help my agency. It didn't really hurt it real bad, but it didn't help allow the agency to grow. The second reason is that you really can't separate the duties of the executive director from fundraising because it really fits right in to their responsibilities as a communicator, a facilitator, and a community leader. It's simply part of the job. And when hiring the CEO, you really must make it perfectly clear to them that it is part of their job. Ask them for, ask them what type of experience they have in fundraising. Ask them how they like to fundraise. Ask them what type, what type of fundraising they have done. And even though it's debatable how much time that CEO should spend on fundraising, I'm gonna really tell you that if your CEO is not out of the office in meetings with either current or prospective contributors, at least 50% of their time, they're not doing their job. Some people say it's a little more, some people say it's less. If they're not out there and we're back, you know, COVID, post COVID, whatever, we're back seeing people face to face. Um, it's really important. Now, the board of directors, I'm going to dive into just a little bit deeper because there are four key fundraising roles for your board of directors. Um, far too many nonprofit fundraisers approach board, board fundraising as if they have boards full of movers and shakers who know how to raise money, even when that's really not the case. The overwhelming majority of board members do not. They're often very uncomfortable doing it. Um, 
And you have to find roles for each of them to do the work that they're doing. And it's really up to the CEO and the development staff person to um, create an environment that empowers the board members. So one of the primary roles of your board when it comes to fundraising is as a visionary, providing leadership for your fundraising strategy and program. The board should be charting a path forward by deciding whether your organization will be growing shrinking or maintaining the status quo in terms of programs and services. This directly impacts your fundraising goal and my board is a partner with me in making those decisions. The board should also be setting broad fundraising goals for the organization in consultation with the staff, as well as, well as making sure that firm deadlines um, behind your fundraise, that there are firm deadlines behind your fundraising strategies. One of the most important roles of the board as fundraising visionaries is to make sure the fundraising program, and Jenny and Nora are gonna shake their head to this, the fundraising program has the people, budget, and resources it needs to meet the organization's revenue goals. I'm working with a nonprofit right now who really is not getting it. And I'm trying to explain to them the type of support they need to be successful. Um, your board should be donors. Your goal is that 100% of your board should be making a contribution to your nonprofit, period, end discussion. When they, when they agree to be a board member, they must know upfront that there is a financial component to it. Whether you're a give, whether you're a, you have a minimum financial contribution, many boards do, or it's a contribution at every level, at any level, it's critically important to be able to say that 100% of the members of your board contribute to your organization. If they're not in, if you're not one of their top three, they might not, of their top three organizations they want to contribute to, that might not be the right board member for you. Um, your board serves as a fundraising ambassador, and this is really an important role. Um, each and every one of your board members should be serving in this capacity. Board members may run away when you tell them that they need to fundraise, and I'm working with some people that are challenged with that now, but almost every board member will agree to serve as ambassador for your nonprofit. And what does that really look like? It means that your board members should help you make connections with people you don't already know. Um, there's something I love to encourage members of the board to do is to open doors because they know, I don't know everybody, I'd like to, I don't know everybody, but they know people that I don't know. And if they're willing just to open up the door and reach out to somebody that they know, it makes your, it makes everyone's job a lot easier and they can go with. I love when they go with you. They don't have to do the ask until they're comfortable doing it, but they need to go with. Um, the fourth and final role for your board in terms of fundraising is, is to play a supporting role in your fundraising efforts. Board members enjoy this role most of all because they can make an impact without soliciting. A great thing for board members to do is to participate in a thankathon. A thankathon is after the money comes in, they make a phone call. Yes, we still use phones, not text, we use phones. And we call and we just, they call and they say on behalf of your organization, they want to thank them for their contribution and their support. It's a pretty painless way for them to be engaged and involved. But the goal in the end is to maximize your board members engagement in fundraising. Um, the, last, the last section is development staff. And they really are the main driver for every aspect of fundraising. The development staff, depending on what their title is, from chief development officer that's more of a visionary, implementer, basically solicitor, et cetera, to a development coordinator or a development manager, development staff, um, that really help to create a realistic fund development plan to meet your organization's financial goals, forecasting future income, and gathering feedback from, from donors. They work very closely with your CEO and your board to identify and cultivate new donors and to steward existing ones. They manage your events, your solicitations, acknowledgement, acknowledging donors, and in a small nonprofit, they probably will manage the donor management software, 
which you need as well. And don't have to spend a fortune on it, but it's important and they juggle it all. Um, so you'll see this slide at the end of all of our presentations. I know you're gonna get a copy of all of them in a PDF. Contact me at any time. If you're sitting as a CEO or an executive director of a nonprofit and you're struggling to juggle all this and manage it, I'm happy to share all that with you. Um, let's see, are the, looks like there's one thing, feel free to turn, yeah, no, okay. Um, seeing no questions in the chat, I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna turn this over to Nora so she can do her thing and then we'll pause at the end of that and um, see if you have any questions because you should. Wait, I, do I see somebody's hand up? I see, do I see somebody's hand up? No, yes, no, okay. Okay, good. Um, all right, Nora, it's all yours. Great. Thank you so much, Rizal. That was wonderful. Um, and thank you to everybody for being here today. Um, my name again is Nora Ellertson. I am a board member of the New Orleans chapter of the Association of Fundraising Professionals. I'm also founder and CEO of The Funding Seed, which is a New Orleans-based company that teaches people how to raise money for nonprofit organizations. Um, I am going to be um, both zooming in and zooming out a little bit here. Um, pivoting off of Roselle's presentation and talk a little bit about um, nonprofit fundraising generally and some best practices to consider adopting at your organization. Then again, Jenny is going to do a deeper dive into grants. Um, I find sometimes with these sessions, hearing one person's voice for like an extended period of time um, can get a little tiresome. So what I would encourage folks to do is as you have questions, Questions or comments, drop those right into the chat. Um, if we have questions partway through uh, this part of the presentation, we can pause for those, um, you know, 10, 15 minutes in, and Roselle has generously agreed to read out questions in the chat. So please don't feel like you have to hold them until the end. So let's get started here. So first thing that I want to talk about in this conversation about nonprofit fundraising is just about why nonprofit organizations need to fundraise in the first place. And um, the reason I think it's important to start here is because the very term nonprofit is like, I have, I have actually a little bit of a problem with it. Um, it's not the greatest term for the type of uh, entity that our organizations are. So um, the important thing for you to know as somebody who's gonna be fundraising for a nonprofit is that there are really two things that make nonprofits what they are and set them apart from, um, in particular, for, from for-profit entities. So the first thing is that nonprofits are intended to have some type of public benefit. That is a very broad term. Um, in fact, until uh, I believe 2015, the NFL was considered a nonprofit organization, and uh, even to the biggest Saint fans, Saints fans in the room here, I'd be willing to bet, you know, thinking of the, the sort of public benefit of the NFL, um, you know, might have raised some question marks. But that's the first kind of defining characteristic is there's supposed to be some kind of public benefit. The second thing, and this is the really important one, is that um, ad, uh, any additional surplus funds that are raised at a nonprofit need to be reinvested into the organization as opposed to at a for-profit where that money can go to um, individual stakeholders or shareholders. So that's really the main difference here. Nonprofit does not mean that this is an agency or an organization that should not be thinking about money, that should not be active in generating income, that, not, that should not be saving money for next year. All of these kind of basic financial best practices that a for-profit organization would have, we want nonprofit organizations to be thinking that way too, because the reality is, for almost every nonprofit organization, we're gonna to need to be around for a long time. Nonprofits tend to be tackling large complex issues that are not going to be solved or addressed overnight. And what that means is that our individual nonprofit institutions need to have the financial resources available to be around next year and five years from now and 10 years from now. And the only way that that happens is if you as the representative 
of your organization, regardless of what your role is at your nonprofit, um, if you are active and proactive in thinking about that income generation. So let's talk about how you make it happen. So the most common sources of funding for nonprofit organizations are what you see on the screen here. I'm gonna run through each of them individually. So the first is individual donors. That just means people like you and me. And when I say you and me, I mean probably every single person who's joining this call today. Um, a majority of adults in the United States give away money to at least one nonprofit organization every year. It is the most common way for people to be directly involved in the issues or causes that they care about. Anytime you have clicked uh, you know, a fund, uh, the link in a fundraising email and entered your credit card information, every time you've mailed back a check in response to a fundraising appeal that you got in your mailbox, you have become an individual donor. So that's the first source of funding for nonprofit organizations. Second source of funding is grants or contracts that can come from either private foundations or local state or federal government agencies. Jenny is going to talk about that more in her part of the pre presentation, so I'm not, not even going to start to dip my toe into that. Um, the third source of funding for nonprofit organizations is donations from for-profit companies. So this could be corporate gifts from larger national or international businesses um, and corporations, and this could also be donations that you get from a small local business and everything in between. These donations sometimes come in the form of a direct gift just for your general services. Often we see them um, instead of that as like a sponsorship for a fundraising event or um, maybe um, helping to fund a particular program at your organization. The fourth thing that you see on here is fundraising events. We're here in New Orleans. We love a good party. Um, most organizations feel the need to have at least one fundraising event during the course of their calendar year. Um, when we think about income that we generate from fundraising events, that money is actually usually coming from two of the other sources that you see on here. So it's either uh, money that you're raising from individuals who purchase tickets to your event or bid on something at a silent auction, or sponsorships that you get from for-profit companies. So those things are already reflected on here. But for most organizations, income that they generate through organizing a fundraising event, typically they consider that sort of its own income category. And then the last uh, example that you have on here is earned income. Earned income is when an organization generates revenue from selling goods or services. So if your nonprofit teaches a class and you charge a tuition fee for that class, that tuition fee, that income is considered earned income. Or if you're selling t-shirts, that's considered earned income. The person is getting something in exchange for the money that you're giving to your nonprofit. Um, there are other ways that some nonprofits raise money. These are the big ones. Um, the other thing I'll say about this is that not every organization raises money from all of these sources, but most raise their money from some combination of them. So um, I'm gonna move on one more slide and then I think we have a couple of uh, questions or comments coming into the chat here. Oh, I got a direct message. So I'm gonna get to that in just a second from Christine. Um, so this slide here uh, is uh, data from an organization called Giving USA. Um, anybody here who's ever been to a workshop that I've run through the funding seed. You've probably seen this data before because I included in like pretty much every workshop that I run. I think it's really important information to have because what you see here is um, all of the data on private charitable giving in the United States. And so what Giving USA does is every year they release a new version of the exact same report and they look at where the money came from and what the money went to. So we're just going to look at where the money came from. First thing that I wanna point out is up at the top here. So this is the most recent report. It's the 2022 report, which means the data is from 2021. So the first thing that I wanna point out is that in 2021, 484.85 billion with a B dollars in private charitable giving went to nonprofit organizations across the United States. So I say private charitable giving because this does not count any government funding 
It also does not count, remember, that earned income category from the last slide. So this is just people, foundations, and for-profit businesses. So the total amount of money given to nonprofits is actually much bigger than this. We're just looking at this private donation section. So that's the first thing, it's a lot of money. Second thing I like to point out here is that individuals, you've probably already noticed, make up by far the largest portion of this pie. So in 2021, 67% of all funding um, from private sources to nonprofits came from individuals. There's another 9% that you see here that's bequests. So bequest is somebody names an organization in their will. In 2021, that person passed away and the money went to that organization. That is really also money coming in from individuals. They're just giving it after they're deceased. So what I usually say is like, we might as well just sort of push those two portions of the pie together. So now we're up to 76% of all private charitable giving coming from people. 19% came from foundations, 4% came from corporations. This is not a weird outlier of a year in 2021. Remember that Giving USA puts this report out every year. And if you look side by side at all of the charts from 2021 and 2020 and 2019, going back and back and back, the breakdown is going to look very similar. So why is this data important? I am not putting this out here because I think that your nonprofit needs to have an income pie that looks like this. We're gonna talk in a minute about all of the different factors that play a role in how you decide your nonprofit is best positioned to fundraise. The only reason that I think it's important to know this is I think there's misinformation out there. What I find is that most people, when they see this chart the first time, they're surprised to see that individuals make up such a large portion uh, of the income and that they expect that foundations and corporations are gonna play a bigger part. So I just want you to have the facts. I want you to have the information and then you just do with that what you will. Um, Roselle, I see you going off mute. I think there's maybe a question in the chat. There is a question. So just to clarify, so nonprofits can charge a fee for items in a service. Again. Yes, yes. Nonprofits can charge a fee for a service. Yes. Um, I will give an asterisk to this, which is that there are um, very strict accounting rules that you need to maintain right. if you're generating any portion of your income from that earned income category. Right. Um, it's taxed differently. And if you don't do the reporting and the income tracking the right way, you can get in a lot of trouble with the IRS and nobody wants that. So if you're gonna be generating income um, from any kind of fee for service or fees for goods that you're, uh, that you're giving away, my basic rule of thumb is check with a certified professional accountant who knows about nonprofits first, mm -hmm. just to make sure you're doing you know, all the tracking and um, all of the, you know, keeping all the documentation the right way. Right, um, just to add on to Nora could breathe for a second. My agency charges a fee for service. We provide counseling, mental health counseling services here. And we run another program here that we actually charge a fee. We have to get, we're audited and we have an annual audit, which um, I know all of the nonprofits when we submit grant requests, all request those audits from us um, for significant grants. So work closely with the accountant that you're working with just to make sure that you're tracking it, as Nora said, to do what you need to do, but you definitely can charge a fee for service and for items. But, but the, the profits or the revenues are invested back in the organization's work. As that, Nora is correct. The beginning. that is correct. That is correct. It's a nonprofit that we're not, right. uh, nobody takes home the, the fluff. It, it goes back into right. doing right. more contribution based That on. is correct. It, yeah, it's, it goes back into, it goes back into our, our operational budget. Um, to provide services that don't we don't receive fee for service for. Yeah. All right, Nora, and catch your breath, you're on. Thanks. And for anybody who's feeling kind of overwhelmed with, with just that one kind of part of nonprofit fundraising, I will share my rule of thumb for anything having to do with like even if it just like touches up against accounting or legal or anything that you're going to have to report report to the IRS, talk with an attorney or talk with an accountant first to just make sure, because they're the ones who are gonna have the most up-to-date information about you know, policy changes and what the best 
practices are. So that's what, you know, Roselle talked about building your board. Like if you have an attorney or an accountant on your board, that gets a lot easier, but um, that's a, a really important um, kind of resource to keep available to you. Um, I did get a direct question uh, that says, can we have a savings or investment account and how do we title it so that it's acceptable accounting wise? I wanna start putting some percentage of funding into it each year so that we can grow. I think what we're talking about here is a version of an endowment fund. Is that how you're hearing that, Roselle? I see you nodding. Yeah, so we have investment accounts. We actually have it through, we, we have most of our investment accounts through the Jewish Endowment Foundation, but we actually have, we don't call them actual endowments because we want the requirements to, to um, access the funds a little bit looser. Um, so yes, we actually put money in savings. It's actually a good thing. They're nonprofits that ask us all, the, they're, they're funders that ask us all the time, how much money do you have set aside to operate if you have zero income or revenue, like during COVID or after Hurricane Ida? So, you know, um, yeah, we have set aside, we've set aside enough funds that we can operate for two years. Now we've done this over many years now, so just breathe that we can operate for two years without any, with zero revenue. Um, so yes, you definitely can set aside money. There's also a question for you, Norris, uh, going back. So should it be a certified accountant and an attorney? Yeah, great question. And by the way, Tasha the Trillionaire, you have such an awesome Zoom name. Um, yes, I would say um, best case scenario, is that you have a, an accountant and an attorney, both of whom are familiar with the nonprofit sector, who are either you have like, you know, professional, you know, so fees that you're paying them, you know, they're like they're they're working for you basically, or they're on your board, or you've got somebody like that will answer the phone if you have to call with a quick question. But for a lot of these things, especially for organizations that are just getting started, making sure that you're following the letter of the law, making sure that your accounting practices are strong from the very beginning is just going to set you up to have a lot more success and do that work much more easily. You won't have to worry about getting into trouble or anything. So yes, accountant and attorney. Are there any local in here in New Orleans you recommend or website outside um, going online uh, in other states? I would love to open this up to the chat if anybody here is either an accountant or an attorney and you're looking for some leads for uh, potential clients, please drop your information into the chat. And um, also, if you have somebody that you're working with, please feel free to drop that into the chat. I'm sure they would love the referral. Okay, so I'm going to move on here. Um, keep the questions and comments coming into the chat. We're going to pause again at the end. Uh, for any more questions or comments. The next thing that I wanna talk about is deciding how to raise money for your specific nonprofit. So remember on the last slide, we looked at kind of like the total data across the United States. Here's how, if you look at all the organizations kind of combined together, here's how they raise their money. The way that your nonprofit raises money is gonna depend on a few different factors. So the first thing that I recommend that you think about is what are the resources and connections that are already available to you? So for example, if you have an executive director who's like a natural networker and knows it, just seems to know everybody around town and they love going out to the events and the cocktail parties, you know, that might mean that you have a lot of potential to raise money from individual donors because you have an executive director who that's something that they're doing already on their own. They're building a lot of trust and a lot of connections around town. And that's building up your base of prospective individual donors. Other organizations might look at the connections that they have on their board. So if they have, you know, 10 board members, um, some of whom are local business owners, others of whom are working for companies that have like a philanthropic arm. Um, they might lean into their board and invite their board to either have their own company donate to the organization or to build some connections if they're an employee at a larger company or a company that gives money away um, for those kinds of corporate donations and sponsorships. So that's the first thing is think about what are the resources what are the connections? What are the skill sets that we already have? The second thing is um, the skill sets and interests that um, 
that you have. And so I'll just give an example here. I worked with a board a number of years ago that they wanted to make sure that every board member felt like they had some meaningful fundraising opportunity that they could kind of take the lead on. So they had one board member who just is like one of those people who just loves hosting parties. That's just kind of her jam. It's her happy place. She decided what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite up, but this is pre COVID. I'm going to invite, invite a bunch of people over to my house. We're going to have a cocktail party. I'm going to give sort of like a five minute presentation on how great this organization is. And we're going to, you know, I'm going to fulfill my fundraising duty as a board member that way. Another board member is a big like Mardi Gras costumer person. And she decided what she was gonna do is have a costume sale. And so she literally like cleaned out her closet, hauled all the costumes out onto her front porch, spent a Saturday afternoon, you know, selling costumes for 10 and 15 and $20. And it's New Orleans, so it did really well. And that was her contribution. And then there was a third board member who lived out of town not like a super get out social person, didn't have a ton of connections in New Orleans specifically, they decided that what they were going to do was have one of those Facebook birthday fundraisers. So when it was their birthday, they set up a fundraising page on Facebook, they posted it all over their Facebook page, and they raised some money from their contacts that way. So three different skill sets, three different types of interests that those three different board members all utilize to fundraise in different ways. Then the third thing is what are the skill sets that we can develop? So I'll give another example here. An organization that I've worked with recently had a new hire, somebody who had just graduated from college, somebody who spent a lot of time during their college career writing, and in particular doing a lot of technical writing. This was somebody who did not have any grant writing experience, but they really enjoyed like digging into data, they were great at following directions. And so they invested some time in training that new hire in grant writing. And with some time and practice, that person became um, a very successful grant writer. So those are all things that you can factor in. Like you don't necessarily, it's great if you can hire somebody who has 20 years of development experience, but if you're not in that place at your organization, the next thing that you could do is just kind of look around at what are the resources and what are the skill sets that we already have on our team in our network and then sort of identify the fundraising activities that correspond with them. So now I want to speak to the folks that are starting a new nonprofit organization. Fundraising for you might be a little bit different than it is for, you know, Roselle talked about it took like years and years for her to, to develop that two year reserve of savings. If you're a really established organization, there might be different fundraising practices um, that you're able to explore. But for a new organization that is maybe still working on building up name recognition, still developing your board, maybe you're still figuring out like like how are we going to offer the services that we plan to offer there? You're going to approach your fundraising in a slightly different way. So one strategy that you can use if you're raising money for a new nonprofit is to do what's called peer to peer fundraising with your team. Peer to peer, sound, it, it's what it sounds like. It's people talking with their friends, family, coworkers, other people in their networks. And the primary thing that they're saying is, I believe in this organization and here is why here is my opportunity for you to donate. And the people, the peers that that board member, founding staff member, whoever they are, um, the, the people that those team members are speaking with are primarily motivated to give because of the re relationship that they have with the person inside your organization who's asking them to give. So even if you don't have your programs up and running yet, if you've got a board member who has friends and family who like trust them and trust that they would only be involved with an organization that's going to be doing really good work in the near future, that board member can set up a peer-to-peer -peer fundraising program and raise money from their own kind of personal contacts. Second opportunity, very small, fundraising events. So like not renting a venue, not hiring a caterer for a big gala. I'm talking about like somebody hosting in their living room or their backyard, doing a cookout or a breakfast or like something small, intimate, 
mostly based on the relationships that you and your team already have. For Again, for some people, for some organizations, that's like part of their brand or part of their interest. And so bringing people together into a shared space where they can learn about the organization and have the opportunity to donate, donate individually um, can be a great kind of starter nonprofit fundraising strategy. Third opportunity is grants that are designed for startup nonprofits. Jenny will um, definitely talk about this more in a minute, but every grant is different and every funder is different. So there are some funders that like they say upright, out, outright from the beginning, we're only going to fund you if you've been in operation for three or more years or you need to have, you know, $100,000 in the bank already. There are other grants that are geared directly towards organizations that are just getting started. So that can be a great opportunity for, for new nonprofits as well. And then for some organizations, if you're already planning on charging for goods or services, you can start doing that early on as a way to generate income. And I've even seen organizations that like, if they're, even if they can't charge for services that they're eventually going to offer, maybe they do like swag sales. So they like, you know, for your $20 donation, you get this t-shirt or this koozie or whatever. And that can be a way, you know, it's small scale, but it can help to bring some initial funds into the organization. Last couple of things before we wrap up for questions and then pass the mic over to Jenny. So before you start raising money, um, these are some important things to have organized, documented, on paper, totally squared away. And if you're looking for like a thing to do this afternoon after you leave the meeting as an immediate next step, I would recommend going to this slide and treating it like a checklist and just making sure you have all of these things, because if there's anything missing from this list, it's going to become a lot harder for you to start raising money. So the first thing is an annual budget for your whole organization. Um, certainly for grants, this, this is something that pretty much every grant funder is going to ask you to submit, like an actual document that outlines all of your income and expenses for the year. Also, individual people that you talk with might want to know how much does it cost for you to do this work? And if you haven't taken the time to create your annual budget, you might not be able to answer that question. So an, a written annual budget is the first thing. Second thing is either a board of directors or a committee of volunteers. If you are going to be registered as, and we'll talk in just a minute about what this means, but if you're gonna be registered as a 501c3 nonprofit, you are legally required on your documents when you file to get that designation from the IRS to have at least three board members. So those people, as Roselle talked about, they're like your kind of your starter fundraising team. So you want to be thoughtful about who you're inviting to join as your founding board members and make sure that they are geared up and fired up about raising money. If you're go going a little more informally, if you're not going to incorporate as a nonprofit, a committee of volunteers is very helpful. So just individual people who again, can help with the fundraising. Maybe they're also helping with programs and administrative tasks. Um, so that's having that team is really important. Third thing, your nonprofit status. So there's the state of Louisiana that design, designates you as a nonprofit organization. And then there's the IRS that creates your federal designation. The most common type of nonprofit organization is what's called a 501c3 nonprofit. It's an organization that has some kind of, again, a public benefit. They don't do political work. They're not a trade organization. Often they're doing direct services. So it takes a while to get that designation from the IRS. When you get it, it's the thing that allows your donors to potentially claim the tax benefit that comes from donating to you. So that's why if you're planning on getting a 501c3, it's a good idea to have it before you start asking for money because some of your donors and funders might want it. If, and this is getting real into the weeds here, if you are not going to have a, your own 501c3 status, if you're you know, really small, if you're doing work that would disqualify you from getting a 501c3, if it's pending and you haven't gotten your designation yet, you can work with what's called a fiscal agent. So let's say that I have a brand new startup nonprofit I don't have my 501c3 yet. 
let's say Jenny does have her own nonprofit and she does have a 501c3 at that organization, Jenny and I can partner up and make an agreement where people who want to donate to my nonprofit give to Jenny's nonprofit and then Jenny transfers the money over to me. So it gets a little bit complicated, but it allows that donor or funder to get the tax benefit. And, you know, it's again, it takes a little more time and effort, but there's some benefit there. Um, the fourth thing is donor and donation tracking. There are databases that are set up specifically to do this, where you can track every single person who donates to your organization, when and how they gave contact information for them. If you're not quite there yet, a spreadsheet is fine for now. It's not a great long-term solution, but minimally you want to have a place where you can keep track of every person and every donation and grant that your organization receives. You need a plan for how you're going to actually start the program work if you haven't started doing that already. So like basically you want donors and funders to be able to give you their donation or their grant and then for there to not be a long lag time before you can turn around and report back to them and say, hey, great news, we're offering these services and these programs now. And then as we've already talked about, talking with an attorney or a CPA is really, really valuable for all of the accounts accounting and legal practices. Roselle, you're going off mute here. Is that, yeah. Yeah. So uh, Margaret asked a question, which I think you've answered, but I know mm -hmm. Jenny will get into more about when applying for grants, should you have your IRS nonprofit status? And Jenny, I think we'll talk about that in a little more detail yeah. in a couple of minutes. Then Christine wrote, a board member who is in IT gives a lot of time setting up and maintaining a website. For example, would their donated time and effort be considered their donation? Or is that more of a responsibility as a board member, they should be expected to do so? Um, I think it's a great question. And the second piece of it is, uh, would also like referrals for donor tracking programs and management. So I'm gonna drop both of those in your lap at one time. <laughs> Thanks, Roselle. Um, so uh, I think on the first question, Different people are going to have different answers for this question. If a, if a board member donates time for professional services outside of their kind of core board responsibility, showing up at meetings, reviewing the financial documents, that kind of thing, does that count as their donation or not? Some nonprofits say yes. And some say no. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go like in the wishy-washy middle here, which is to say, I think it sort of depends on the intent. So there are some board members that like literally they just don't have any financial capacity to give at all. They're not giving to any other organizations. It's just, and you don't want to prevent somebody who provides a valuable perspective. Um, at your organization from joining your board. And in my opinion, for that reason alone. And so in some cases, that board member for donating their, their time for their professional services, that might be considered their donation. Where I think it gets a little tricky is the precedent that it sets because what you, you don't wanna have that imply is that a board member who does have financial capacity to give, and when I say financial capacity, I've worked with board members who give $10 as their annual gift. It is the only donation they give to any organization that year. They budget for it, they plan for it. It is, it is a significant gift for them and their family. So what I'm talking about here is you don't wanna set the expectation for board members who can give financially that they are now off the hook. So this is where sort of individual board management and the relationships that you have with your board members becomes really important. And I think it's a conversation for actually the board to have together about what are the expectations that we have for all of our board members for giving, for fundraising, for other time that they donate to the organization. Again, you know, even Roselle and Jenny might have very different ways that they answer that question. Every organization is different. Different fundraising professionals think about this in different ways. So since you're asking me, that's my, <laughs> that's my two cents on it. Um, the second question was about donor databases. Um, I'll give a couple of recommendations. The bottom line is you should find the one that you will actually use. Yes. Um, I've seen organizations that spend time and money setting up um, databases that 
they then never use because they just like they don't meet the organization's needs or they're too complicated. So you should test anything out before you actually spend money on it. The three that I recommend, like do some YouTube searches on these and then trust your gut. Um, so one is Bloomerang. Um, what I like about Bloomerang is that they can customize their system for the organization. So if you have different kinds of information that you want to keep track of, in addition to the individual people who donate, they can set it up to work for you that way. Um, the second is Little Green Light. The reason that I sometimes recommend that one is that it's good for organizations that have some budget for a database, but not a huge budget for it. It's pretty simple. They have monthly payment plans. And then the third one is Salesforce. And I recommend it reluctantly because I consistently hear from people who use it about um, just how frustrating it is to work with. So why am I recommending it? Well, they have a free version for nonprofit organizations. So if you have a $0 budget, you could look into Salesforce for nonprofits. Most databases will give you the opportunity to do a free 30-day trial. All of them, you can find tutorial videos on YouTube for free. So the big thing is just test it out before you sign a contract or invest a bunch of money in it. Yeah, do we I'm going to bounce other? in. I'm going to yeah. bounce in real quick. I use, in my agency, they were using something called, uh, let's see, it wasn't Excel. It was Access. I think that was like the Antiquity and Microsoft and the Office Suite. Where they, when I came in here almost eight years ago, they were using that and I cringed. And, but we didn't have the, uh, we didn't have the finances to really invest massive money in donor management software. But me being the fundraising head, I said, I really need something. And we went with LGL. It was competitive in price. It was not too complex because I knew nobody was going to use all the different fancy, you know, the Rolls Royce version of donor management. It was a waste of money. And I knew that I really sat down and really evaluated what we were going to use it for and the purpose. And um, we're basically pleased. None of them are perfect. You will have positives and negatives. You can get a bunch of us in the room and we can hash and trash all of them. But um, they're positives and negatives. You just got to figure out what works for you. But starting out with an Excel spreadsheet where you can capture all, yes, it's a, a little green light, it's LGL, little green light, um, you, where you can capture all that information because you never, and I know Nora would say this, a, one, a, 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 a person who gives one contribution to organization can be developed and moves through moves management to a, a regular contributor. And you need all of that contact information, um, not only their name, and what they gave, but everything, phone numbers, emails, uh, ad, you know, addresses, anything you can capture on them, you can start in a spreadsheet. You're going to need the spreadsheet anyway to dump it into your donor management software. Yeah, that's great advice. Thank you for that, Roselle. And then um, I'm noticing that in the chat, Jenny has very helpfully dropped in links mm -hmm. to um, all three of those um, examples that we talked about there. I'll also say if you are somebody who is already working with a donor database, um, please feel free to drop that information into the chat. Either mm -hmm. things that you really like about it or mm -hmm. cautionary tales, things that you wish you had learned before you signed the contract, that is really helpful <laughs> information um, for folks that are shopping around to uh, hear about. So um, we're about to bring it in for landing on this portion of the workshop. I do wanna just um, kind of briefly share some things that are important just in terms of like communication with your prospective donors and funders, things that like, these are helpful talking points for you to develop with your team. Anybody who's going to be talking with people about your organization, applying for grants, setting up fundraising pages, anything like that, have this conversation first and have it regularly so that as things evolve at your organization, everybody continues to be on the same page. So the first thing is what's the issue that we're addressing? So we are we working to end the experience of homelessness in our community? What's the like what's the core issue, the reason for our organization to exist? The second question is how do we address that issue? So what are the specific things that our organization is doing 
in order to meet that goal that we have created for an organization, that public benefit that our organization is working to achieve. So what are the services that we're offering? What does that look like from a sort of constituent perspective? Like when we're working with an individual or with a family or with the community, what does that look like? What are the results and what are the expected results? So in other words, like how do we know if we're doing our work right or not? I'm sure Jenny will talk about this too. A lot of grant, uh, grant funders will ask you this question directly, like at the end of the grant period, what do you expect the results to be? But it's also an important question for you to be able to answer on your team because you need to know if the way that you're addressing the issue is actually effective or not. So for example, like let's say that you're working with an organization that is providing job training. If the type of job training that you're offering, you do an, eva an evaluation six months or a year in, and you realize that, you know, 8% of the graduates are ending up placed in a job in their desired field, that might mean that you need to make some adjustments to the way that you are delivering that service. So what are the expected results? And then you have to actually be able to track them. What does this look like in real life? So not to open up a huge can of worms here, but ethical storytelling in the nonprofit sector is a really, really important topic. Um, we could do a whole separate webinar just on that. Margaret, maybe make note if that's something that interests you. Um, but telling the stories about your organization is a really powerful way for people outside your organization to understand what you do and why it's important for your organization to exist. Where it gets into the ethical storytelling part of it is sort of a challenge that I would put out to you as somebody who's, um, you know, describing your nonprofit's work to outsiders. You want to make sure that anytime you're telling a story on behalf of a client, a constituent, somebody that your organization is working with, that they are very involved in that storytelling process. So they get the chance to opt out if they're not comfortable sharing their story, as much as possible sharing their story in their own words, um, giving them the opportunity to review things before they go public and pull their, um, their consent to have their story be told publicly. All of that is really important. There's a lot of potential to actually do harm to the individuals and communities that we're serving if we're not really mindful about the way that we tell our, our organization stories, particularly when we're telling stories on behalf of other people. So you do wanna think about this for your organization. How do we describe the work that our organization does to somebody who might be very much an outsider and to be really thoughtful about what's the process that we go through when we're thinking about how we craft um, and share that story. And the last thing that you wanna be able to have prepared in order to share it with a donor or a funder is just how much the work costs. So annual budget for sure, but also ideas of like specific expenses. If you have a new program that you're going to launch, what is that going to cost short-term and long-term expenses? Again, these are all questions that it's important to bring to your whole team to be able to answer and then to periodically revisit as your organization continues to grow. And that is where I am going to leave off here. Um, all of, again, all of the Association of Fundraising Professionals, Greater New Orleans chapter information is here. You can also see my contact information and the Funding Seeds website. I think we have one comment in the chat here. Is that right? Yeah, it's so. a thumbs up. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Margaret. All right. So with that said, I'm going to stop my share and turn it over to Jenny to bring us home with grant writing. Okay, hi, <laughs> um, let me get going here. Okay, there we go. Um, so I'm gonna start my remarks uh, before I get into the, um, the grant component of it by doing a quick commercial for AFP. You've heard us talk about this um, periodically through each of, our uh, each of our sessions. The Association of Fundraising Professionals is the most valuable investment that I've made in my career um, being involved. I am currently the chapter president, so I am a little biased, but I have to say uh, that I've been a member virtually my entire career. Um, Nora Roselle and I are, are, are friends and colleagues with each other. It's a great atmosphere to for like-minded people, and it's a fantastic um, 
resource um, for, for, for collegiality and to answer a lot of the questions you've been asking today. Tasha, if you were go to, to go to an AFP meeting and ask people who their CPA and attorneys are, you would get all kinds of recommendations for moving forward with your uh, with, with your efforts, and it's a, it's a great resource and a place to to ask. I, I, I ask Nora on a regular basis what I should be doing with my life, and she tells me, and she's always right. Um, you know, and, and Roselle pays me. So, you know, it's, it, it's been a beneficial relationship in many, many ways. Um, the AFP International, it, we, are, we are a local chapter of an international organization. There are many, many incredibly valuable resources on the international um, organization's website uh, that are accessible only to members. Um, there are multiple membership levels available. And when you get the slides for this presentation, you will also get a flyer about what those membership levels are, what some of our member benefits are, uh, and how you can engage with AFP. Um, we have a meeting coming up next week, uh, tying into both what Roselle and Nora have been talking about. Uh, our October, we, we meet once a month, uh, an annual or monthly lunch meeting that is centered around uh, an educational topic relevant to nonprofits. Next week, we're on October 13th, Thursday, October 13th. Uh, we are hearing a presentation about engaging and energizing your board. Um, it'll be at the cannery and we'll have a lovely lunch and we'll learn all sorts of great things about managing our board. So um, I, shoot, I was, well, when I'm not, <laughs> when I'm not sharing my screen, I will drop a link to that unless Rosella or Nora wants to. I had, I had it up, but I, now I realize I can't copy it. So um, we would love to see you there. We would love to uh, be friends with you uh, and and introduce you to lots of other fantastic nonprofit executives uh, who are working in the city. And last part of the commercial, um, AFP International, the international organization that we fall under, has a massive and uh, full annual conference each year. Um, this in 2023, the annual conference is in New Orleans. It is a huge conference with uh, international fundraising experts. Um, and so if you go to our website and sign up for our newsletter and, and get in our, on our mailing list, we'll make sure that you uh, know about the international conference, which is coming. It's, it's an expensive conference. It's a lot cheaper to go as a member. So I would ask you to consider how AFP can help advance your career. And with that, I'm going to get into grant writing. <laughs> I have to apologize. I am um, recovering from COVID and I still haven't fully recovered my voice. So if I get froggy uh, and drink lots of water, please bear with me. <clears throat> so today I'm gonna to talk about the fundamentals of grant writing for a nonprofit organization. Uh, as Roselle said in my intro, I, I, I teach a semester long class about this. So it is challenging to, to do this, to cover, enough material to give you tools, but not so much that we're here until tomorrow. So this is a pretty high level overview um, designed to give you some basic information and some tools where you can dig deeper in terms of your grant writing. I do wanna reiterate that we are talking about grant writing for nonprofit organizations. Um, in general, most foundations um, will only write grant, will only make a gift of a grant to an organization that has usually a 501c3 status. There are a few kind of outliers, but in general, um, their financial and legal qualifications only allow them to give gifts to certain types of entities. So we are not talking about small business grants here in general. A lot of the principles that we're talking about could be applied to other vendors of small business funding, but but that's not my area of expertise. My area of expertise is uh, nonprofit organizations applying for grant funding. I do want to tag on also about the fiscal agent conversation. There are a few organizations out there, and I did not anticipate this conversation going this way, so I haven't done a lot of homework, uh, or, or I haven't updated my homework lately. There are agencies out there who are designed to serve as fiscal agents for one-time projects or community events. A lot of them are arts related. Uh, one of them is the National Performance Network, which can serve, which you know, part of their mission is, is to be the, the fiscal agent for um, 
for projects. Uh, know that the New Orleans Video Access Center is another one that sometimes documentaries, things like that will go through. There used to be one called the National, the Neighborhood Partnership Network when we really started um, seeing a lot of neighborhood associations. But um, I did have a chance to Google that while the others were talking and they don't appear to exist anymore. But do a little homework and look and see if there's a fiscal agent if you're not either thinking about doing a 501c3 or still waiting for it. Um, it happens a lot. Sometimes it may give you an opportunity to ask the question of whether or not you need to exist as a separate 501c3 or if in fact partnering with a larger organization working in the same space may be the right fit for you. Um, but but I wanted to make sure that we laid that out, that there are some agencies out there. Uh, the Greater New Orleans Foundation may be able to point you to some. Um, so um, on that note, I'm gonna jump into grant writing fundamentals. I put this slide in virtually every presentation that I do. And I'm not a big fan of reading slides directly to you, but I'm going to right now. The golden rule of philanthropy is that the heart of philanthropy is the premise that you are offering a donor the opportunity to invest in something that they believe in. You are, the, the donor is not interested in what, what you need. The donor is interested in what, in, in, in making a difference in something that's important to them. If you address hunger, if you address uh, women's health, if you address early childhood education, and that's a value to the donor, a grant is a conversation about how investing in you can address the difference that they want to make. And that's true for grant writing and that's true for individuals as well. I'm not, you know, I'm, I appreciate animal welfare charities. I'm not uh, as big on public art projects. If you're asking me to make a contribution of my funds, I'm, I'm going to give my money where my heart is. Um, and, and, and that, that works on all levels of philanthropy, that it's not about what your organization needs. It is about how your organization is addressing something that's important to the person that you're asking money, asking for money. Um, so you're, you're, you're a vessel <laughs> for them in a sense, and that is how you want to position that conversation. Here is how I or we or our organization is impacting this thing that we know you care about. And I'm going to get into finding out what they care about in a little more detail here in the coming slides. So in general, there are five-ish different kinds of foundations, and I'm going to take this kind of out of order. The one in the middle, uh, family foundations, is, is what you see the most of, or private foundations is really what it should be. Um, these are freestanding entities with a board um, sometimes the board are family members, sometimes they are employees like Baptist Community Ministries is the largest foundation in the city. Um, maybe the Greater Rolls Foundation might be bigger now. I'm not sure. But yeah, you know, these are private private foundations with their own governing bodies who who make grants to nonprofits. Uh, so that's the kind of the and you may have you know, the Gates Foundation is a large national foundation. You know, I can't tell you as a fundraiser and if the rest of you pursue fundraising, you will hear this too, where you go to a cocktail party and somebody asks what you do and you tell them and they say, you know what you should do? You should ask that Bill Gates for money. He's got a lot of money. Yes, he does. <laughs> and he does have a foundation and he doesn't really write grants in Louisiana. And we're going to get in again to how you find that fit. But there are lots of other local foundations that do. Um, community foundations, going back to the top of the list, is, is the next thing I want to talk about. So these freestanding foundations that I just talked about are their own separate entity under the IRS and the government. Um, they, there are a lot of benefits um, to setting up a foundation for, uh, protect, for maximizing your wealth and maximizing your benefit to, to the community, uh, but it's a lot of work to administer a foundation. And so within the last 20, 30 years, this concept of community foundations, which are sort of co-ops really, where uh, lots of people can have their own fund that they operate like their own foundation, but they all work in aggregate together. An example of this is the Greater New Orleans Foundation. 
The Greater New Orleans Foundation does not have a lot of its own money, as it were. They have a lot of individuals who have um, decided that they'd like to have a fund at the Greater New Orleans Foundation that they make gifts out of. And the Greater New Orleans Foundation administers all of those funds um, and, and does all the work associated with tracking the, the IRS obligations and, and writing the actual physical check and, and investing the, the principal of the funds. So, and, and, and there's the Baton Rouge Area Foundation and there's the Rapids Foundation in Alexandria and it's a growing, uh, the more, there's a North Shore Foundation, there's a Bayou Region Foundation. Uh, these are growing more and more. Some like the Greater New Orleans Foundation do operate periodic opportunities to apply for funds, but in general, they, they, the people who run the Greater New Orleans Foundation aren't really giving out the money so much as they are stewarding other people's funds. So it's not necessarily the most obvious place to go, but it is a great resource. Um, and they do have a lot of information about what people are, are there to invest in. Corporate foundations are another kind of foundation. Um, so, like Entergy has corporate giving and it has a foundation. Um, different companies run that different ways, but sometimes the gift is directly from a corporation. And sometimes it's from a foundation. The reason I'm kind of going into this in depth is because as you start doing research, I want you to understand what it is that you're seeing when you look at prospective foundations that you might want to approach. So the last two, you don't really go to. Limited purpose foundations are like the Oxner Foundation or the, the LSU Foundation. Um, they are entities that fundraise for a specific entity and are not grant making types of foundations, even though they're called foundations. And the last one is operating foundations, which is kind of similar. It's like the uh, Lake Pontchartrain Basin Foundation. It's like the New Orleans Recreation Department Foundation, where they're they're sort of they're giving to their own programs and also not typically a place where you would submit a grant. When <clears throat> somebody calls me and says they're looking for a grant writer and and, and, and I dig deeper, I often find that what, what they need is, is money. Um, and they think that, that writing a grant is gonna solve that problem and, and, and it can help. But I wanna remind you of the pie chart that Nora showed that is in all of my presentations as well. It's just not here today because you've already seen it. And remind you that foundations were only 19% of, of that pie that Nora showed you. Um, you know, grants are not generally your lifeblood. They're not your primary source of funding because they don't just renew every year. They don't, they're not consistent. They're, they're, they have a beginning, middle, and an end. And if you're relying specifically on grants, um, you're not going to be as secure as if you have a more diverse uh, pool of funding sources like the other opportunities that Nora spoke on. So Grants are for program development or expansion or startup. Um, in general, yeah, a funder wants a concise product, project, something that's that's that that they are sort of investing in. They may not be the only investor. You know, you can have a fifty thousand dollar project and ask for five ten thousand dollar gifts toward that project. But when you're writing a grant proposal, it needs to have sort of clean edges. It needs to be a specific, like we're adding on um, another afternoon to our after school program, or we are expanding to include more children in our after school program, or we are starting up a new after school program. Um, and, and so, you know, a, a successful grant has sort of that component of, of a trajectory uh, and, and clean edges. We don't wanna rely on grant funding for regular and recurring operation expenses, but, and I'm gonna talk about this more when we get to the budget, there are some regular operating expenses that realistically can be part of your program budget. But the big rule is you, you wanna spend as much effort in identifying and researching your prospect as you do your proposal, because going back to that golden rule, it's about aligning with the funder's priorities. So, finding that alignment and 
making that alignment extremely clear in your proposal to them is a critical element of a successful grant. Now you can be creative about that. You know, if they are interested in uh, mental health and you are a music program, um, there are a lot of components about children learning music that have positive mental health benefits. And so if I were writing a grant for a youth music program to a music focused foundation, I would be writing a very different grant than if I were writing to a mental health focused foundation where I would be emphasizing a lot more the mental health benefits of music versus the continua continuation of bearing New Orleans culture through its musical roots that I might say to the Tipitinas Foundation. Because foundations generally have a predetermined area of interest and you're wasting your time if you're trying to force your program into something they're not interested in. Um, they can't fund everything um, and, and they don't want to fund everything. They want to make, you're the vehicle through which they want to make a difference in the world. And if they've decided Baptist Community Ministries funds health, education, and public safety, and that's what they fund and that's what they want to make a difference in. And if you're uh, uh, an animal rights organization, um, you know, they, they don't fund animals. Other, other nonprofits do. Um, and, and it's not that your work isn't valuable. It just doesn't align. And, and so if you are, um, if you're a humane organization, a humane animal organization, don't write to BCM. Um, now, you know, on BCM being Baptist Community Ministries, um, if they don't publish, yeah, you know, Baptist Community Ministries has a website that tells you very clearly what I just told you. Um, they don't all have websites. So if we need to find out if they're going to fit what we're looking for, there's a few resources we can use. The Foundation Center is a paid grant research vehicle. I do not now, nor do I ever, um, support the idea of a, particularly a small organization paying for a subscription to a grant search software. It's expensive. Um, and what happens is you put in New Orleans, Louisiana, women's health and search, and you'll get a foundation out of Idaho that has listed itself as funding in, uh, nationwide. But when you go and look at their giving history, they haven't given a gift outside of Idaho in 10 years. Why are they going to give a gift in Louisiana? Like these, these, these research engines can be very useful, but you have to dig deeper. You're going to, you'll get a lot back that doesn't really fit. Um, however, if you are really learning the local landscape and you don't know who the local foundations are, it could be a useful tool, but don't pay for it. The Greater New Orleans Foundation has a subscription and they'll allow nonprofits to to use it, they kind of changed the rules since the pandemic. So you'd have to contact them. I, I believe it's limited to a certain number of visits in a year or something, but um, but the Foundation Center is a great resource. It's, it would cost you thousands of dollars to pay for it and you don't need to uh, when you can go to the Greater New Orleans Foundation. They used to have access to it at the public library downtown, but I don't think they do anymore. So once you find that foundation and, and you wanna know if they, um, really only given Idaho, um, a great resource is guidestar.org. Uh, that's the second bullet there, GuideStar. Found nonprofits, which include foundations in this case, or different classifications of organizations use a, an IRS form 990, which is their equivalent of our 1040. Um, th this is how, this is their annual tax return to the IRS. A foundation must list on its tax return all of the grants that it gave in the prior year by list by organization to whom the grant was made. And in some cases there's detail about what it was for and the amount that was given. So if we know that the Eugenie and Joseph Jones Foundation based in New Orleans is somebody we wanna look at and apply to, uh, but the Jones Foundation doesn't have a website um, and we don't really know what they're interested in. We can go to GuideStar and we can pull their most recent publicly available 990, which is a couple of years back. Um, and we can look at every single grant and we can look at these, these are the last three years, 990 is there at least. 
So we can look at all of their grants for a period of three years. What that tells us is who, what kinds of organizations they're typically giving to and what size their grants usually are. There's always outliers where they gave a million dollars to LSU and then $500 to somebody else, which was probably a ticket to a gala. But in general, there's a, there's a mean and a median that gives you an idea of where you should be coming in with your ask. And if they even demonstrate an interest in the type of work that you do. Some other places, there are some email newsletters that go out with grant subscription opportunities. I've listed a few of the ones that I subscribe to here. Um, when I start working with a new client and they do something I'm not, that I haven't worked in before, one of the first things I'll do is look at, the, is, is borrow information from their competition. If it's a youth arts organization and I don't really know who funds youth, youth arts, I'll go look at other youth arts organizations' websites uh, Roselle is a Jewish family service. I might go look at the, the Jewish Federation's website to see who they've gotten grants from lately or the JCC or uh, the Jewish Community Day School um, and look at, oh, I didn't realize these people gave to uh, Jewish Federated interest. And it's not a guarantee that they're going to give to me because they may have had a friend on the, you know, board of trustees at the, the Jewish Day School, but it gives me some guidance to dig deeper in terms of looking at organizations who are in a similar field of interest as the one that I'm researching for to see, hopefully they have a list of donors on their website um, and they're recognizing and stewarding their donors in a meaningful way. Uh, but digging through their newsletters can be another way if they have back issues of their newsletters attached to their website um, and they got a big grant, they probably did an article in their newsletter about it or looking at the news page on their website or some of their prior um, some of their prior announcements, uh, it can also be a good source. Uh, and finally, just Googling. I mean, you know, you, you get a lot of foundations you're not looking for, um, but you know, you can usually develop a trail to start clicking down when you're doing research for potential prospects. But the most important thing I want to impress upon you right now is that your mission your, should always be the center of the process. If we are an after-school program and we do arts, we do music with youth, and we see that the Wilson Foundation, that's the, the Rawlings Foundation is, is funding tennis programs. Well, we're, you know, our program is operated in a school building and there are tennis courts there. I mean, we could do a tennis program too. It, don't do that. <laughs> don't, don't you make your decisions on the kind of programs you're going to do and then find a funder that fits it. Um, mission drift is, and if you know if you're new and and you're and you're really anxious to raise some money, I I can hear the siren song. And I get it, but the reality is, funders don't need to be making our decisions on on how we impact the community for us. Um, the mission has to be the center of our process, and the reality is, even if you get one year of tennis program funding, when the grant is over. Um, are you, you're going to have to lay off your tennis coach and give away the rackets and the balls because you don't have, you have not as, as an organization made the decision to institutionalize and continue to pursue this kind of programming. Um, and there's nothing that makes me matter than when people hire somebody off for a grant with no plan to maintain that human being's employment after the first year um, because grants are not revolving doors. They, they come, they go. And that's why we look for a succinct project that has a beginning, middle, and an end that is sustainable in some way on the other end. Either uh, because we are building up our, uh, our other revenue streams in the meantime, and then have made the decision that we would do this whether we had the grant anyway. Um, and so, you know, we have a commitment to continue to fund it or if, if, if it's ultimately going to generate revenue through income that will support it once we get it going, uh, or we're just going to have to continue to write grants, but it's important enough for us that we're going to focus our ongoing fundraising efforts to continuing this program. So I, Zoom is not allowing me to see the time on the screen, so I keep looking at my phone, so I don't go over. Um, so some rules are 
I know that it's your adults and I don't need to tell you to follow the, you know, follow the instructions, but apparently I do need to tell you to follow the instructions because anytime I talk to a, a, a grant making entity, I ask them, what would, what percent of your proposals would you say are complete and, and filled out in accordance with the guidelines? And the answer is usually like 20% max, which means that 80% of us are doing something wrong. <laughs> There, these five foundations have to say no a whole lot more than they say yes. If you are not compliant with the guidelines of the organization of the, of the foundation, that can be an automatic dismissal. I mean, they they can tell if you've got your act together and that you clearly recycled an old proposal and 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 changed the name on it and sent it in without any guidance on what the information they're actually asking for in their guidelines is very, very clear. And, and you very immediately come across as somebody who doesn't have their act together. There's often a scoring rubric with these questions that they ask and you get points based on how you did on defining the need or defining the project design or going through the outline uh, or outcomes. Um, and so using headings to guide the reviewer, if, they, if there's a section where they see, you know, what is the problem that you are addressing? You know, then I had that problem addressed you know, in bold with a colon. And underneath that, I answer the specific question they ask me for how I'm going to address that problem. If there are page or character limits, you, you need to abide. Anything you do that breaks the rules can make you automatically denied. And furthermore, most, most uh, applications are online these days anyway, and they're usually character limited. And by the way, just tuck this away somewhere, character limit always means with spaces which is really annoying, especially if you're like me and you double space after your period. <laughs> you gotta go and take all those out. But if there's character limits, um, you can take my double space out of my cold dead hands. I'm gonna keep doing it. <laughs> but if there are character limits, be aware of them. Uh, there's nothing more frustrating than doing really hard work on a proposal and then realizing you have to cut half of what you wrote because it doesn't fit. Um, moving along, because we're running low. Um, Okay, um, when you write, you need to be accountable. I was having a conversation with another client about this yesterday that, you know, well, who decides what the outcomes of the program are? Well, I mean, I can if you want me to, but you know, I'm done once the money comes in. You know, this is a contract. You're going to have to do what you said you were going to do. So if you're saying you're going to spend the money a certain way, then whoever spends the money better be engaged in that conversation uh, and know what they're committing themselves to. If we say we're going to serve 200 kids, then the people who run the children's program better be part of the conversation if they're, they don't think there's any way they're going to reach 200 kids. Like this is, you have, it, throughout your proposal, you have, you have an, an obligation to be accountable for what you propose. Life happens and the real world happens and hurricanes happen and pandemics happen and people get pregnant and go on maternity leave and, and, and things happen and change that impact whether or not you were successful at what you chose to do. But when you're submitting the grant, it is your best estimate of what you think is going to happen because the grant is a contract. And if you don't, you have to spend the money how you said you were going to spend it. And if you don't spend the money, you have to give it back. Um, so you want to consider making sure the voice of all the people who need to be involved in that discussion are there. Um, and also that, after you have the grant, the funder's going to expect a report on what you said was going to happen. Um, and, and so whatever you propose is going to happen, bear in mind, you're going to have to report on that when it's done. And what they want to see what you is that you made the difference that they wish to see in the world, um, that you were the vehicle for change, that you impacted women's health um, through your grant in a, in a meaningful way. I see a chat. Oh, yes, I agree. The Oxford comma is also not being pried out of my cold dead hands. Um, okay. So the, the first part of virtually any grant application is the statement of need uh, or the problem statement or what is the issue you're trying to address. This is where you're aligned with your funder. This is where it's like, you know, we care about early childhood education. So does this funder. Now, now I need to make a point for why the work that we're doing is so important. 
it is not about you. It is about the problem. Like I, I tell my students this when they when they write their statement of needs. Like your organization's name really shouldn't appear in this section at all. I used to be the development director at Second Harvest, and which is a big warehouse, essentially full of food, but a big warehouse. And the the operations manager would come to my office and say, Jenny, I need a forklift. And I would look at him and say, Jack, I don't care. So what? Like no, no funder cares that you need a forklift. Now let's take that to no child should go to bed hungry, but one in four do in Louisiana. And then, and then let's look at how having a forklift means that fewer children go to bed hungry and draw that logical leap. But where I have to start is a data-driven case for why childhood hunger is a really big issue in Louisiana and particularly in New Orleans. And it needs to be fact-based. It needs to be appropriate. It needs to be professional. But we are also writing to a person. I want them to really care about the fact that there are children who are are going to bed hungry and having to get up and go to school with no energy uh, and then sitting in a classroom where they can't absorb the information that the, the, the teacher is telling them because who can concentrate when they're hungry? But if we do a breakfast program, we're going to turn out these outcomes around. You know, it needs, it needs to... It needs to show the problem that you're addressing, which needs to align with the problem that the that the foundation also wants to address and really make a strong case for how this gift is going to make a meaningful change in the world of childhood hunger or of animal welfare or of women's health. So my rule of thumb, and I generally tend to work with agencies that are well-established, um, and I've been doing it a long time. I love to start with the budget. Um, I, I will frequently, add, if a client wants me to write about a specific program that they're doing, the first thing I want to see is the budget. Because I cannot defend why you need the money if you don't know how you're going to spend it. Right? We need $20,000 for our, um, our workforce development program for Opportunity Youth. Okay, great. So what do you do? Well, you know, I mean, we have a curriculum and we uh, you know, train them and, okay, show me how you're spending $20,000. That gives me all the information I need to know about how to make a compelling argument that, that this money will make a change. I should be able to look at your project budget and be able to tell what you do, at least ish, even if you completely took the name of the organization, the name of the project off, the budget should tell me enough of a story. So we're not just, we don't just have staff on there. We have life skills training staff. We have workforce development manager. We have a uh, workforce development curriculum that, that this, the budget, if, if we can start and we can figure out exactly what we need by walking through the budget. I was working, I teach class on Wednesday nights and I had a student last night who was working through this and she has her she's working with a nonprofit organization that serves foster children. And she specifically wants to, to build out the mental health services that they need. And so we realized we had to start with her budget to figure out how much she could afford because mental health services are, just, are expensive um, to figure out how much she, like she didn't, she can't raise a million dollars. So the, you know, the Cadillac uh, of mental health services might cost a million dollars, but let's figure out if we're in the $50,000 range so that we kind of know what to ask for and, and figuring out the budget and figuring out how many people we want to serve and how deeply we want to serve them guided that conversation. So we knew what to ask for. Um, here's the most important thing I can tell you in the little time I have left. If you are the executive director or you have an executive director, and you run two programs. You have a early childhood education program and you have a senior daycare program. The executive director spends some time on both of those things. Those things exist in your building where you pay utilities and maintenance and copier fees and insurance and all sorts of other things. It is a mistake to write your program budget that only covers the things that you directly write a check for. We're, we're a workforce development program, so we're buying uniforms, and we're hiring one person to run the program, and we're, we have to pay for this curriculum, 
and the students get a stipend and that's all that's in the budget. The budget should include, we're using 20% of the building on this. So we've got 20% of our electricity. We've got 20% of our insurance. We've got 20% of our rent. Um, the executive director doesn't run this program directly, but they supervise the person who does. And furthermore, they do support work to make that program operate. That belongs in your project budget. You generally cannot write grants for general operating expenses. Sometimes you can. But in general, you're looking at restricted funds. The funds that Nora was talking about earlier are generally unrestricted. For a grant, you're talking about funds that are restricted for a specific expenditure. You want to include lots of things that laterally are attached to that program that may not be, particularly new nonprofits, just they're writing a, like a receipt, of like all the stuff they have to buy just to do this thing, but they're not figuring in, we have to pay for a space, we have to pay for, we have to have a, an administrator. Those things belong in your project budget, and then you're allowed to spend your restricted grant funds on those. Because the question becomes like, why won't anybody write, let us write a grant to keep the lights on? Well, because you didn't ask them, <laughs> you know, but you have to keep the lights on in that 20% of the building that you're using for your workforce development program. The, the project budget is the best planning tool you have. Sitting your program staff down and saying, okay, I hear you guys that you want, uh, you want to start an uh, after school music program. All right, How, 10 kids, okay, great. So we need two keyboards, we need a couple of bongos, we need at least two teachers, so we have a one to five ratio, we need a curriculum, we're gonna use this space. Like figuring out all of those things gives you all the information that you need to write a strong proposal. Most, but the most important thing I can tell you <laughs> is, Funders don't care what your organization needs. They care what the community needs. And, and, and so do you, you know? It, it, you, yes, we need a forklift because a forklift will allow us to load more trucks with food and get more food out to the community because it's taking us too long to load the trucks with a hand pallet jack. So we could load trucks faster and distribute more food if we had another forklift. I'd be happy to give you the money for that forklift if I know that, not, you know, the operations guys are tired of pushing the pallet jack. You know, there, there is, there's a benefit that meets a community need, which is that children are hungry. And we address that by raising money for a forklift. So the grant is about what will be better if the gift is made, not about the organization need. It is funding because you are the vehicle for the difference that they wish to make in the world. These are two books that I strongly recommend. Um, the one on the left is sort of the science and the one on the right is sort of the art. I use them both in my class and I use them together. Uh, we read about the statement of need in one and then the other and they, they complement each other very well in understanding what the components of a grant are. Uh, and you will get these slides. So, um, so that's the end. Again, I really wanna encourage you to get involved with AFP. Uh, we would love to see you. We would love to see you next Thursday at the cannery. Uh, for our discussion on boards. Uh, and we would love for you to come to all of our stuff and get involved in our community. And here's how you can reach me if you need to. Uh, are there any questions? Yeah, you always have some questions for Jenny. Quick plug on next week's meeting. Um, a dear friend of mine and colleague, Susan Mancuso, is actually the one that's going to be presenting. And she is a fabulous presenter a fabulous presenter. I'm looking forward to it. Even though I'm on vacation, I'm coming. Um, you know, really? one of the things that I, I was going to say, you won't see Nora or Roselle because they're going to be out, but, but no, I'm, I'm, I'm in town. This is a vacation. I'm in town. So I'm actually going to get dressed and come. Um, I want to make a comment to y'all about repeating what you heard from Nora and from Jenny that, you know, you're, you, you're inviting people to contribute, whether it's a grant or an individual, they're contributing through your organization to affect change that's aligned with their desires. They're not giving to you, they're giving through you. And I always, um, I always encourage people to remember that. You're not asking them to give to, I don't ask people to give to Jewish Family Service. 
I'm asking them to give through Jewish Family Service to touch to touch the lives of uh, Jenny. I love this because we write plenty of grants for Teen Life Counts to touch the lives of middle and high school students in the New Orleans area um, that have mental health challenges and are dealing with issues of suicidal ideation. And I don't use fancy words like that, but I use plain English. And Jenny probably will tell you also that we also make sure that the grants are written in really good English. We want people to be able to understand them and read them. Um, but that's a thread you're going to hear through all of this. Um, I know you all must have a million questions for Jenny because my head is spinning. Um, and if, if there are any questions for Nora as well, um, because they've covered a lot of material since we started at 12 noon. So um, you can ask it in the chat or unmute and ask your question. We're a small enough group. Um, I really encourage you to do that. Who wants somebody ask? Let's see. No, come on, guys. Come on, everyone. Now's the time to ask any questions that you have. Um, Jenny, I'm going to ask a question while they're all being shy. Um, what happens? You know, I, I just was involved in a, sig a significant grant and we're expanding one of our program staff from, thir from five to 13. And Jenny made a really good point because they came out, we're lucky, the funder actually came out and wanted to know percentage of occupancy, percentage of utilities and expenses, phones, um, a percentage of our auditing services, our, our, our contract for our annual audit, they're paying for part of that. They're paying a percentage of supervisory staff. Um, what do you do when a funder, a grant, or any funder only wants to pay for the program? And they don't believe they, and I don't want to pay for staff. I mean, it happens. Stump the funder. What do, you, what do you do? If they, if they only want to buy uniforms, you let them buy the uniforms. But, don't, but that's last resort. You know, too many nonprofits, particularly new nonprofits who ha don't haven't had a few years behind them doing this, think that they have to write the grant for uniforms. You're not writing a grant for uniforms. You're writing a grant for your workforce development program. There are a few. Every funder, every funder is valuable, and I appreciate them all. But there are some really annoying ones who just want to pay for the one thing. And if 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 you've got to do it and you've got to buy the uniforms anyway. But that's not your starting point. Your starting point is we have a workforce development program that has all these line items. One of them is uniforms. The whole program cost $100,000. Will you contribute $10,000 toward this program cost? I, we're kind of going down a rabbit hole here that I'm going to confuse you more Sorry. than clarify. But Sorry. no, no, no. But the, you know, when you present a project budget, it needs to be balanced. You need to show where you plan to get the balance and it may, you know, it, it's projections. Uh, but, you know, if you give them a hundred thousand dollar program budget, you need to show also a hundred thousand dollars in revenue, which includes their grant and other grants that you may not have yet, but that you're projecting how you're going to raise. Because if you don't think you can raise a hundred thousand dollars, then don't do a hundred thousand dollar program. You know, you, it, the plan, yeah, that's why the budget is such a useful planning tool. What do we reasonably think we need and what do we reasonably think that we can raise? Grants with startup costs are tricky, um, and I uh, would welcome Nora to jump in on this because she works with more new organizations than I do, but places like incubators like Propeller can be a good spot for that. Nora, what would you add to that? Yeah, there are um, incubator groups like Propeller is a great example here in New Orleans that works with nonprofit and for-profit startups, and um, one of the many things that they do with startups in their kind of network is help to connect them with um, prospective funders. Um, that's not going to be an option for every organization. So I would say if you're going to spend some time on one of the grant databases that Jenny mentioned, like, um, like the foundation directory, you can do a search within those directories for funders that specifically uh, fund new and emerging nonprofit organizations. I do want to circle back though. I, I think Jenny's right for a lot of, um, for a lot of organizations, 
when they're first getting started and like they don't have a sort of documented track record yet, they don't have name recognition, probably they don't have paid staff yet if they're brand, brand new. Um, often a helpful place to start is by working with the founding staff and board members to reach out to their own networks and even doing, um, you know, like crowdfunding is a term that some of you may be um, familiar with, which is usually geared more around getting like a large volume of, and I use air quotes here, small donations. I don't really like that term because we, we never really know what any, you know, a $10 or $25 gift might mean to the person who's giving it. But for crowdfunding, that describes a fundraising strategy where you're reaching a lot of people who collectively are contributing a larger amount of money individually, they might be giving in 10 and 25 and 50 and hundred dollar increments. So um, some organizations that are like super community focused and don't feel like they have access yet to um, like high net worth individuals or like really big, well-resourced companies can do that kind of more community centered fundraising where you can work with your own networks and collectively get some of those startup costs. Now, I know it's hard, like if you're talking about a $100,000 program, really hard to do that, you know, 10 and $25 at a time. But this, we're talking about like right out of the gates from like at the very beginning before you have kind of anything else established at your organization, that can be a way that you can get some kind of initial funding in the door um, while you're waiting to be eligible for more of those other grant opportunities. Uh, we have a question from Christine. At what age are you not a startup? We are entering our fifth year, no paid staff yet. Christine, what organization are you with, please? While well, Christine is either typing yeah. or going, oh, Ozone, you. Music, Ozone Education. Music Education Foundation. Thank you. Um, I, so I have some, one response to this, which is there's, I don't think there's a, like a technical definition of like the tipping point between startup and established. I've seen grant funders commonly use three years as a bench, um, benchmark. Jenny, I don't know if you would disagree, <clears throat> excuse me, disagree with that. Um, but like three to five years at a certain point, I would think like, you're not so much a startup as you are a small shop nonprofit. So like a lot of the organizations that I work with, they might be like 10 or 15 or 20 years in operation, but they might still be all volunteer run, or maybe they have like one staff person, but it's largely board members and volunteers who are doing a lot of the work that paid staff might, uh, might offer at another organization. So they might still in some ways be operating like a startup in terms of their staff size and their budget size, but they've been around for longer, they have more of a track record, they have more experience, they just haven't built up, um, you know, a budget or a staff. I, I would agree that it has more to do with the <clears throat> sort of capacity and operational sophistication than it has to do with the actual age. Um, that, you know, sort of, ha have you sort of hit your stride or are you still, are you still building to get to I mean, you're, hopefully you're always growing, right? And we're always trying to do better, you know, but are you, are you, are, are you still in launch phase? If so, you're still a startup. Have you, are you, are you, are you sort of half baked at this point? Then you're not. Uh, but, you know, I do want to kind of add on to this and, and say a really grinchy thing that, that I want, don't want you to hate me for. You are not going to launch and operate a, a startup on grant funds alone. It's, it's not right. going to happen. I'm sorry. It's not. You, it's, it's, it, and, and I, when I first started working in, 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 as, as a consultant, you know, and I worked with some startups and I'm like, oh, they've got a brilliant concept and, 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 you know, they got a good plan and it's based on a national model and they got a strong board. And I can remember going to funders I knew and trying to pitch it and being told, Jenny, honey, I know you believe in this, but they're not going to be around in a year. And well, of course they will be, they've got this and they were not around in a year. Like it, you're, you're. As a startup investment, you are a risk. Sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you can grow your base and, and show that you, you have a foundation, maybe you can get a couple of small grants that are, that are low risk for, with, orga with organizations like Propeller. 
but you will not launch a fully baked organization on grant funds alone. Um, it, it's just too hard. It is too competitive and, and, and a new organization is too risky. Doesn't mean mm -hmm. that there aren't great startup opportunities, but you've got to build all the other sides as well. I can write a brilliant grant for a startup, but if they don't have any history of, if the bank account's only been open for a month, you know, it's hard to, to convince a funder to, to write a substantial check that would be substantial enough for you to grow on. But they, but, you know, they might join in with some others at a lower level. Yeah, I, I'm going to piggyback on that because I was going to make that comment that you have to diversify your funding. Um, I've seen nonprofits that were started. There was a window for about eight or 10 years after Hurricane Katrina where it was pretty easy to be approved as a 501c3. And I would sit in meetings, actually a lot of times at the Greater New Orleans Foundation with some of these smaller shop startups, and they got three or five year massive grants, either from a foundation or it was a government grant, and they were huge. And they, it was in sessions talking about how you diversify your funding. And I'm looking at them going, so you're in the final year of your grant. What other money have you brought in? And they're looking at me like a deer in the headlights. And I'm thinking they're not going to be here because they didn't diversify their funding. Jenny's point is a lot of times those grant, those foundations want to know who's giving individually. Is your board giving? I've talked about 100% board participation. What other funds are you, are you, um, do you have access to? Who else is contributing to your organization, sometimes before they put their money in because they want to see that you have something that's more balanced. Um, and it's, it's really, really critical that if you are lucky and money lands in your lap to start your fabulous project for your fabulous non-project profit, if that happens that that big grant comes in first, good for you. But if you, that, the minute that big grant comes in, you better balance the other side. And it had a lot to do with what Nora was talking about, about especially individual individual contributors and how you build up that campaign. It's really critical. There's a reason um, we use that pie chart in, in all of our presentations all the time is to show, you know, the individuals are where most, uh, the vast majority of the money is coming from. So while I agree with Nora that you're, you don't need to make your graph look exactly like that, your graph should not be 100% of any one thing. Right. Right. It's not going to be. It's not realistic. It, it, it doesn't work in practice. You will get yeah. the pie chart in the in the Norris. All of our slides yeah. will be um, and Norris Norris um, has. Yeah. You will you will get the slide chart. Another comment about some of the stuff we were talking about. I've turned down grant opportunities. Ah, Jenny and I brainstormed. There's a grant coming up that looks great, and she and I have figured out: is this something realistic that we can? Um, you know, that that is aligned with our, which is realistically aligned with our mission, because we could do a whole session on mission drift or mission creep and what that means. Um, and I was actually working with the executive committee of a board earlier this week on some stuff. And they asked me, have you declined grants or have you de have you declined an individual contribution from somebody who has a great idea and is going to write a big check up front, big check up front. Have you turned it down? And yes, I have. And it's hard. But you have to look at sustainability. Can you sustain a program? It's staff and it's the individual's lives that you're affecting change in that you don't want to drop them and not be able to sustain the work that you're doing. So I think those are critical pieces. Um, and it's hard. Let me tell you, it's really hard to look somebody in the eye and go, no. Uh, thank you, but no thank you. But hopefully you get the skill to have a conversation to see maybe where you can redirect them to someplace else that way that's a little bit more aligned in my work. What else guys we have like two minutes. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to remind everybody I want to thank Margaret for inviting us to do this. This was fun. It was fun for the three of us to do something together, which is nice. Um, uh, that was great. We really want to thank everybody for the opportunity to speak to you today. Margaret is going to close in a second, but I and she put she popped something in also into the chat. Um, we thank y'all for taking the time to to um, 
listen to us today. You're going to get our contact information. Please reach out. I'm just going to tell you just a plug. Nora and Jenny are rock stars in our profession in this community. And it's a joy for me whenever I can sit and listen to them make presentations because they're really, really good. So, um, uh, Margaret, it's all yours, dear, to close. Thank you, ladies, for your expertise and your informative presentation. I think we had an awesome session today. This will conclude the nonprofit focus sessions. I want to thank everyone for joining us today, especially our speakers. Um, if you called in, please send me your email address so I can um, send you the slides from today's presentation. Within five to 10 business days, this session will be available on the Office of Economic Development YouTube channel, along with previous recorded sessions. Remember to check your email for future scheduled sessions. Again, my name is Margaret McGee. Don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions and everyone have a great day. Thanks, Margaret. Bye guys, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank y'all so much.